there's really no distinction in our minds between animation and live action. It's really all about telling the story. And we're not writing cartoon music, we're writing expressive film music. And it just happens to be for characters that are drawn rather than live action. We were originally put together by Shirley Walker, who was looking for a lot of different composers to work with her on Batman the Animated Series. Um, she kind of put the word out around town, different people, different places, some studio stuff, some private stuff. And um, my demo made its way to her, your demo made its way to her through, well, just through Warner Brothers. And then Chris, yours made it to her through her son. <laughs> her son, Ian. Um, so we didn't know each other at all, and we weren't really looking to work with anyone else necessarily as, composer, as a composer team. Um, but er, when she put her team together and, and selected the people that she wanted to work with, it ended up being the three of us at the end of the day after she auditioned, I think like, what was it, 30, 35 composers, something like that. We didn't set out to be a composer team, but we ended up being a composer team, and it was kind of brilliant because we each had something different to offer musically, and she saw that and saw that strength that each one of us had that was very different, and eventually, since we'd been working together so much, we just stayed together. Yeah, it's interesting because a lot of times uh, the, the student is looking for the composer that they can study with or, or that they can work for, and in our case, it was the call of well, Shirley Walker is looking for people and, and we'd like to recommend you. And, and it's one of those, oh, right, okay, is, what, what's the catch? And it, there really wasn't a catch. It was that she, she was interested in working with serious, aspiring composers. I mean, I considered my cons myself a composer. I was a working orchestrator, a very busy orchestrator at the time. But just that opportunity to be, be mentored, and actually not just mentored, but work for her and be paid and treated very much as a professional from day one, even though we were officially students at that time still. Mm, we were. She, I think at first we were students. She was responsible for my first professional work as a composer, so I guess she kind of helped us make that transition mm -hmm. from, from being, you know, students being mentored to being someone who had a credit that was a valid credit, and she was extremely careful that we should all receive credit both on the cue sheet and on the screen for what we did, which was highly unusual, still highly unusual. Uh, she wanted to leave working on animated television projects and, she, and focus on feature films. And she went to Warner Brothers and said, these people have been working for you, you should continue to work with them. And they agreed, thankfully. And so why are we still together? Because we understood that, that the team synergy, the working together, the camaraderie, the support, the sharing of the um, responsibilities and also the ability to have kind of a really good work-life balance and not just kill ourselves trying to be composers was something that, that worked really well for all three of us. I think also the, the quality of the music, the idea that there are three of us working simultaneously on a project and we can bounce ideas off of one another, but also the producer or director, uh, producer for television or director for film, will actually get this collective energy of the three of us laughing at the right spots, crying at the right spots, not making a reaction at the right s at the <laughs> spot so they figure, oh, maybe we need some music to help with the reaction. And um, honestly, just to work with such talented composers is just is such a gift. Mm -hmm. So been pretty marvelous. I think just it's helped us to sustain our careers by working with each other and being inspired by each other. We have our own collaboration that we do in addition to the collaboration that we have with our directors and producers that we work with. And so when we're not working with directors and producers, we're still collaborating with each other. So that collaboration is kind of an all-encompassing thing and that's what infuses our creative lives with, with I think, a whole lot more possibilities and, and inspiration. Writing for superheroes, they're larger than life, and sometimes we can be outrageous, and sometimes we can be really scary. And we can, it can be the, the dynamics of our expression can really be from here to all the way here. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely not boring. It's, there's, there's very little time to just kind of sit and do nothing, unless we're not playing music, I think. Yeah, I mean, I, I didn't know that writing music for superheroes was a thing. 
um, when I first wanted to be a film composer, I thought I was going to be writing for for films, you know, for for just any subject matter. But then this call came from Shirley Walker, and you know, started writing for Batman. I would never have guessed that that one gig, Batman the Animated Series, would have turned into over 20 years of writing for superheroes. I didn't even know that was a possibility. I didn't even know that that was a niche. But but it has, and it's just been such a wonderful, wild ride so far. We're continuing on later this year with the fourth season of Young Justice, and, which is a complete reimagining of the superhero world altogether, and musically as well, which is exciting for us as creative people. So. Uh, yeah, I, I just I would I could never have dreamed that this would be a thing, and if I could have, I would have, and I would have said, yeah, I want to do that. And so, what, what's the anniversary? We have celebrated Batman Beyond's anniversary. What was um, the, the show? Uh, Batman Beyond just had its twentieth anniversary, so we've we've been around these characters for quite a, quite a long time. Yeah. yeah, that's fun at conventions when when we play our themes and Chris's Batman Beyond theme like you hear that opening and the whole crowd just goes nuts and it's like <laughs> it's like Chris is the rock star you know we all worked on that but it's like that's yeah. that's the theme yeah. that gets everybody just going nuts so we have to let our filmmakers set the limits of how scary we can be or how intense and uh, it's not often at least in the shows that we've worked on that there is that limit a lot of times uh, the the filmmakers want to just be, be as scary as possible and as, as raw and, or violent and um, yeah it's it's really something that we have to we have to be led by the the, the story that the filmmakers want to tell. The, the demographic that we usually work in is is older than a, you know than preschool and kids like that that would be adversely affected by that kind of emotional expression I think our demographic skews older and so we have a lot more leeway. We may know that a story is going to have a certain element, and then we'll sit down with the filmmakers and they'll show it to us. And there's blood and mayhem and destruction, and then we think, okay, well now we know what we have to do because they went there. <laughs> I think in wor in working on on new, a new project, generally we're looking for the idea, the the style, the the voice of the project with the director or producer. So that's the main collaboration at first. And so at, when we start on something, we're throwing all sorts of ideas around and, and getting their reaction. And um, sometimes having the other, t other composers to bounce ideas off of and also to have, not have everything be so precious. So if the director doesn't like something I've done, he, may, he or she may gravitate towards Michael's idea or Christopher's and I won't crumble in, in despair that they don't like my idea because we have the gig and we will, work around, we will work together towards finding that unique voice that is the voice of the show or the film. That's happened several times actually yeah. where one of us, will, and, and sometimes it happens that one of us will have an idea that we don't even really think is that great of an idea but another one of us will say, let's throw this in the mix, you know, let's just see, let's get that reaction. And who knew? And sometimes the the person will choose that particular idea. And if like if I was working on my own, I wouldn't have put that forward. But I, it's sort of I sort of have more courage to do that because you know I have my colleagues who've said, well, actually, it's really it really is a good idea. And so that also helps us keep the gig. <laughs> when we get into the 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 process of actually writing an episode, you know, once you have the the general direction set. I think that there's, there aren't any limits at all of us working together because um, there's some cues that you'll write that will be a lot of hard work and there's other cues that you'll be very inspired. And when we are dividing up the, the work of, of the show, we all make sure that we, we each have to do some of the hard work, but also if there's something that really spoke to us, something that we're very passionate about, we, can, we often try to have it where that composer can focus on that so they can bring their top idea, their passion. Uh, to make that piece of music the best that it can be. Well, I think a, a person who's in a studio, w their own studio, with their own samples and their own resources, the best thing they could possibly do is to leave their studio, <laughs> go somewhere else where they can interact with other musicians or even just listen to live musicians. Um, listening to recordings and following a score, I think, is a really good idea because 
then you can sort of see, well, this is what was written down on the page, and that's how the music's going to be made. They're going to, the musician is going to read something off of a piece of, off, off of a part, off of, off of their part, and they're going to bring that to life. So following a score will let you see, well, this is what the composer wrote, but this is what they got back. And the whole trick about composing, I think, music isn't really music until it, it exists in the air and in real time. Music on the page is fine, but it, you know, no one can experience that until they actually get to hear it. And so the trick is to figure out, well, what do I need to write on the page so that I can get something back you know, from the live musician? Once you know that, then you, kind of, you can kind of reverse engineer it and say, okay, well, when I'm sitting down in front of my keyboard in my studio, how can I perform this so that it sounds natural, like something the musician would have performed? So I think there's sort of two steps to that, but I think the more, the more interaction you can have with live music or with recorded live musicians, because I know for myself, when I was in college, I was constantly listening to recordings of orchestras, constantly like four or five hours a day, anytime between a class, walking from this building to that building, I had music in my ears and it was always live music. And being able to listen deeply into those recordings and hear in my head and see in my head what are the violins playing, what are the violas playing, you know, and then making that connection between this is what's really happening, you know, so that way, because otherwise you just end up writing piano pieces for all the different musicians and you don't want that. I think, um, I think the trained musician is one type of musician, the, the just somebody who's going by feel, who has, who doesn't read music but can work on the, on the computer. Um, the best tool really is to just go to the, those concerts and watch watch the musicians play and see why am I feeling what I'm feeling? What am I? What is making me feel this way? Because sometimes you want to hear, you feel like you want everything playing all at once. Now, if you're doing that with no matter how great your samples are, if you're doing having everything play at once, it's going to sound like some sort of pipe organ. It just will not sound great. It won't sound like a real orchestra. So start taking things back. There are free concerts. Most universities have great orchestras. Go to those concerts. Watch. See, okay, the clarinet's picking up the clarinet. I keep coming back to the clarinet. I don't know why I'm coming back to the clarinet. <laughs> the French horn. My daughter plays the French horn. Picks up the French horn. Now, you're not going to have the French horn play for, for 400 measures. But, you know, this can. But is that... So if you want that, I think you can have that, but understand that that's not what a real... What a, in a real orchestral setting unless you want to kill your musicians, you know. So if you want the real thing, watch what they do, understand, understand also why, I think, why samples are sampled in the ranges that they're sampled. You know, it's not, if you're going to try to get a pianissimo French horn with no bright sound, I mean, way up high, I don't, maybe there are two people in the world that can play that way. Most people, when they get really high, are not going to be able to play with the sound that they can play in mid-range. So just watch what people play, listen, observe, and then try to apply it to what you're writing. Yeah, I think one of the, the pitfalls that, that uh, composers that aren't, uh, aren't orchestral musicians might fall into is trying to approach the orchestra like you do the piano. And you can, you can almost tell that, that it's like sitting at the, at the piano and playing the chords. It doesn't really breathe the way that an orchestra does. And so I do think that it's, it would be very valuable to um, to look at, at scores that have been masterfully orchestrated. I mean, Ravel, for instance, is a brilliant, brilliant orchestrator. And when he orchestrated uh, Mussorgsky's pictures at an exhibition, which was originally simply just a concert piano piece, um, if you pick up the, many of the scores for that, they have the orchestrated version and the piano part at the bottom. And you can tell when you look at it, uh, Ravel didn't add a note. He was simply orchestrating in a beautiful orchestral fashion the, the exact notes that Mussorgsky wrote in his original piano part, and it's just brilliant and very informative. For, for me, when I'm, when I'm in my studio, I'm only writing music. That's all I do in my studio. If I'm not writing music, I'm not in my studio. It's very important for me to leave the studio if I'm not writing music. I don't take phone calls in there that have nothing to do with work. I don't relax in there. The studio is for music for me. And I get my best ideas when I'm bathing, so I, you know, if I am needing inspiration, sometimes I'll just go take a shower, and I have actually waterproof paper in my shower in a pad with a pencil, 
And wow. I write I write staff paper and I write the idea <laughs> on my waterproof. I'm not kidding. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't all I these this. years I didn't know you have yeah, paper no, in your shower. Waterproof power Fantastic. paper in my shower and I write my ideas in the shower. I also have a pool in back and sometimes I will go swimming. And the act of the water running over my body, this is very personal, but the act of the water <laughs> running over my body allows me to intellectually and creatively relax in such a way that things start to flow forth. And I think it's maybe like a sensory deprivation thing, mm -hmm. maybe a little bit like a sense tank, if you know what that is. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'll do anything other than write music if I need to write music. If I, I write my best music when I'm not trying to write my best music. So I think, you know, nature, um, not listening to music, very important to not listen to music for me. I, I don't really get that inspired when I'm, in my own way, when I'm listening to other people's music. To me, that's distracting. Um, but but I'll, I'll do all sorts of things. I'll t I love going for drives. I'll get in my car and go for like an hour and a half drive down PCH. And, you know, stop the car and write an idea down. You know, I mean, that's, I think that's the right way of doing it. You've got you've to somehow get out of this idea that there's writer's block. I've never ever had writer's block. I know people do have that, but you know, whenever that scenario is coming on, I really feel like it's, you've got to jolt yourself out of that by doing something completely different because I find that I think of things when I'm not supposed to be thinking of them. And that goes for like things I need to do during the day. I'll think of something while I'm writing music that I need to do in the kitchen. And so then I have to go and make a note of that so that when I'm done writing music, I can go in the kitchen and do that. So we're, our brains are not really in sync a lot with what we're doing in life. So I think doing something else will open the door to being able to, doing what, to do what we really need to do. I mean, for me, I think um, the biggest thing is there, there are, there's music inside of me that feels like it has to come out. That's not always the case, but sometimes, often for work, it has to come out every day when I have a deadline. So I'm very focused if I have my job and I know how many minutes I need to get done, I get that done in that time. I'm not a procrastinator. That's a real positive thing for me. The negative part of that is that because I'm not a procrastinator, when I have a gig, I'm always like, I gotta get this done, I gotta get this done, I gotta get this done. And then I do have to, I do have to force myself to take really great breaks and um, I walk in the morning, I walk a long time. I love to travel, so a great reward for me is to know that, okay, I'll get, I'll get this job done, and then I'm gonna go on a two-week vacation, and these guys can cover, these guys can be on call and do the rest of it. And um, I, I'm very inspired by other, other people, people's stories, other things that have nothing to do with this business. And um, that also includes music that doesn't have anything to do with this business. And you fly. Chris flies. <laughs> he goes up above the clouds. I do. I have my pilot's license. And so when I want to feel like I want to get above it all, get more perspective from a bird's eye view, I do that literally and go get in the plane. And uh, that, that allows me to relax and not worry so much about the idea and just reconnect with, with, with um, spirituality and, and meditate and, and still fly the plane, but, uh, but just, just let, let the, the universe talk to you because then the universe is ready to talk to you if you don't put up all these walls waiting for it to talk to you. You just got to be open and ready to receive it. We've done a lot of work with superheroes, much of our career from Batman the Animated Series, Batman Beyond, Teen Titans, Justice League. On the Marvel side, we've worked on Marvel's Avengers Assemble and Marvel Rising. Um, it's been a lot of the same characters over all these years, but every filmmaker that we've, been, uh, that we've worked with wants to put their own stamp on it. And I think musically we do the same thing. And it's really refreshing to say, okay, sure, this, this show also has Batman, this show also has Superman, but what can we say musically that will give this show its own identity? And um, how can we best tell the story that the filmmakers come to us to tell? Yeah, I think getting away from it a little bit too is, is healthy. And then come, when, when we come back into it, it's, it's really exciting. I mean, we're excited to be starting up on season four of Young Justice. I think one of the keys to keeping it fresh after 30 years of writing for superheroes now <laughs> is this. Because when I hear something that Lolita's written, you know, for in the same episode that I've written, or I hear something that Chris has written, it's not what I would have written. 
And I usually learn something every time from what I hear from each one of them. And that usually is the catalyst for me doing something a little bit different that I didn't know would work. Uh, I wouldn't have taken that approach, but you guys, you know, you'll do your own individual approach just as any composer would do. And then I'll hear that and I'll think, oh, that really works. I want to try that next time and I want to do it my way. And I think we all feed off of each other in that way. And that's what keeps it fresh for, for me and for us. And I mean, I don't, I, how many Batman shows have we done? More than, probably more than this. And I'm talking series with, you know, 80 episodes, 70 episodes. But there's always some new thing to discover. And I think having three people working together as we do and as we have for so long, um, it always helps me discover things that I never would have discovered on my own. It was, it was Michael's idea um, when we were working on Batman the Killing Joke. Uh, and we were trying to figure out, you know, how we were going to allocate our budget for live instruments. And, you know, there's so many great string samples, but you said we should use the live strings and have everything else be sampled. And it was just, it was this incredible light bulb moment because that was, you know, to have that session with these great players and it made everything else sound even better yeah. somehow, you know. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I remember even like even on the song that Mark Hamill sings this crazy song that that we wrote that is like a maniacal tune called I Go Looney when, when we're in the studio with him and and he he brought his life and energy into this crazy song that we wrote and then having having had that experience with these great musicians it's just that all of a sudden elevated I mean that was a Batman project but it was completely different than a C one Batman Brave and the Bold, for instance. So it's yeah. night and day, right? I like Audiority products. I think they're very affordable and they're very useful and they plug right into Omnisphere and I just think they sound great. Do I have anything that's free? Maybe I do and I don't even know it. You know, it's, we tend to, we, well, Chris tends to get everything and then he gives us a report. I think so, that's how I found out about yeah. this. We yeah. probably talked about it. But it's uh, I think you try things out and uh, there certainly are things that are that are very inexpensive. Um, I was going to say a pencil, but you know, that's that's not very expensive. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've never recorded a pencil. No, garage, but no, but but just to to write on a piece of paper. Um, oh, yes. <laughs> garage band, I don't know. That's uh, Well, uh, Reaper is free as far as a digital audio workstation. Yeah. Um, and I know a lot of people, even I believe it has video, I don't use it, so I'm not familiar with it, but I hear a lot of people talk about it, and it has video functions, and I think you can do scoring with it, and, and yes, it, it's totally free. We've had a few fun field trips. We'll all go together. And yes. go, we went to uh, the, some of the film, film music festivals where we've conducted our works, and you know, we went to Kr Krakow and, and Tenerife, and. Ubeda, Ubeda. Ubeda. And, yeah. and, and a couple of things in the States where we'll go, and that's fun. You know, we go to, I don't, we don't socialize that much. We're certainly friends, but it's, um, I think it's those festivals and we have some, some fun. Yeah, and there's a lot of crossover when you're in a business like the entertainment business yeah. because you go to a party, but it's not really a party. It's really work. But you want to have fun because it's a party. And so, you know, I mean, we'll all go to these events and things together. And we, we either go together or we show up there and we're all together. And, you know, we have that, as, that social aspect. It's really powerful to have that kind of, it's, it's deeper than friendship. It's kind of like, like part of my backbone are these two that, that hold me up when I need them to hold up and that are my biggest champions when something really great happens or something not so great. Um, also, um, with my work with the Alliance for Women Film Composers, I've been a real big advocate and one of the founders of that organization to help achieve gender parity and, and open the door for diverse voices in our business. And, and uh, these guys never made me feel like I was anything less than a, a great composer because of the fact that I was a I am. <laughs> I was going to say I was a woman. I am a woman. I've always been. A, but anyway, but it's one of those things where they've been here. They've been here for me 100 so. percent. Well, it's a woman who brought us all together. Let's not yeah. forget that. I think now the the door is is much wider open to just. I mean, I think it's almost it's it's a 
people are seeking out those diverse voices so now is a really good time to step it up and don't let anything whether you're you know no matter what gender you are or sexual orientation or anything don't let anything hold you back to think that I can't do something because you know I don't necessarily see anyone doing what I want to do that that looks like me or is or sounds like me just you if you're comfortable in your own skin and you understand that you have a place at the table keep asking for that and when you have that opportunity make sure you're ready to you're ready to to oh, go through that door and not be shy about it